And we are live. Greetings and salutations at Beautiful Beans. And thank you so much for joining me today as I have special guests. Yes, you can see we have Wolfgang and Celeste here today. Wolfgang, how are you doing? Doing splendidly, thank you. Fantastic. Celeste, how are you? Absolutely excellent. Excited to be here. Fantastic. Me too, because today we are talking about one of my very favorite topics. We are talking about pocket dimensions, shadow realms, parallel universes, the portals that get us to and from them. This is such an amazing way to uh, create all sorts of variances in your world, variances in your story, throw crazy character things at at your characters. Um, amazing origin stories as well, can I just say. Um, and uh, yeah, we're going to be unpacking that all of that in just a minute. But first, let me introduce my wonderful guests as they are far too polite to introduce themselves. Wolfgang Bauer is one of the biggest names in tabletop gaming as well as being the head Cobalt over at Cobalt Press. He is the main brain behind the Midgard setting and has also worked on Ghost of Salt Marsh, Courts of the Shadow Face, Scarlet Citadel, Southlands, and is currently working on... And uh, in fact, is just about to release the book of Ebon Tides, yes. which he wrote with Celeste. Tell us just a little bit about the book of Ebon Tides. Ooh, well, um, it happens to be um, a fey, dark, shadowy dimension next to the mortal world. And so it's, it is the Courts of the Shadow Fey world expanded. It is one of the things people have requested for years. And frankly, it's a book I've wanted to write since about 1983. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Uh, I'm so excited to hear about this. And of course, co-collaborator Celeste Connowich is a game designer based out of Seattle, a producer, a DM, an editor. She sings, she dances, she creates the podcast <laughs> Adventure Maidens. And when not plotting behind the screen, you can see her championing femme lead shows such as the co-founder of Penwick Studio Podcast Network. She works as a full-time designer for two to see gaming, I beg your pardon, and has freelanced with companies like everybody, Wizards of the Coast, <laughs> Cobalt Press, MCDM Productions, you name it, if they're all since Celeste has worked with them. Celeste, tell us, what was your involvement in the book of Ebon Tides? Yeah, well, I think, I, I mean, I've been telling Wolfgang and Cobalt Press forever, I, I love the Fae. Uh, I'm sure that had something to do with me getting invited onto this project. Uh -huh. uh, I, I've always, I've been enchanted with the mischievous nature of the Fae, that whimsical danger uh, that is so inherent to them and their world and their politics. Uh, so I had the privilege of writing a bunch of uh, mechanical stuff for this product. So we've got some, some cool player options, We've got some DM stuff. We've got some monsters. Uh, I was really thrilled to be able to write a, a big portion of the Book of Ebon Tides. Very exciting. I've been promised mist. I've been promised mystery. I cannot <laughs> wait for this. Folks, I've just shared the Kickstarter in the chat. You can go and follow it and get notified when it goes live. And then you can learn more about it and uh, see if it's for you. As we always say, if it is for you, why not back it? And if it's not, why not share it so that somebody else can find a book that they will fall in love with? And yes. uh, there's a little, little extra thing Wolfgang has very kindly given us for to raffle off today. Courts of the Shadow Fae, so the predecessor of the new book, is currently yes. uh, in our raffle, exclamation point raffle, to take part, and you must be a follower of the channel in order to participate in that raffle. I think it's time to jump into our pocket realm questions. So I'm going to be using the word pocket realms a lot. Uh, this is just a shortcut to say parallel universes, fluid space, the portal to Narnia, right? What, what you find in the back of your wardrobe. It can be as big as an entire universe. It can be as small as a house. These are yes. pocket realms. Uh, so what is the definition of a pocket realm? Like, yeah. how, how do you define that? I have a definition, and I'm sure Celeste has one too. Nice. Mine is simply, when you leave your everyday world, whatever everyday world means for you, and go somewhere where the rules all change, right? Or change enough for you to notice, right? You walk through the wardrobe, past the fur coats, and you're in Narnia, and there's a fawn. Hmm. So it is, I think, it's a, it's a doorway to uh, adventure, right? And it's a doorway to changing um, from the mundane into the magical, usually. Yeah. 
Amazing. Celeste, anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, Pocket Realms, it's always that that space that's in between, that space that's other, that space that exists in the, there's the world we know and then everything beyond it uh, becomes this, this pocket space. It's a theme we see in a lot of media, a lot of pop culture, you know, the in-between, the upside down, the shadows, anything that we cannot see and understand conceivably. So there's a lot of... I think fear, there's a lot of mystery that comes from from these spaces and going to them, exploring something else, the other uh, is is all what Pocket Realms are about and super fun for us as game designers when we actually get to play in these spaces because people walking into them realize it's different and realize the rules are going to be different. So there is that constant expectation of something new, something different. Yeah, absolutely. Um, folks, remember that you can ask your questions in the chat and we will be addressing those at the end of the stream. Uh, let's throw some examples around. We've talked about Narnia, uh, other pocket realm examples, Fey Wilds, of course, being one. Yes. I mean, in gaming and in literature, they're everywhere. Yeah. Um, I think there's too much older examples I want to put forward. And then there's a gaming example I've got too. But um, we talk about the Fey a couple of times. I think the land under the hill is a classic pocket dimension, right? You leave where humans live and you go to eat and feast and sleep with the Fey. Well, that's different. And I think that story has been around since the Stone Age, right? Mm -hmm. Like those other spaces, um, we love them, right? And, and certainly, the Fae are sort of the original, not human, not quite of our world people. Uh, the other one that I think is much more focused comes from the uh, the Arabian Nights, 1001 Arabian Nights, which is the city mm. in a bottle, mm. uh, which is a, I mean, the concept's straightforward, right? You've got a bottle, there's a city in it. You can go into the bottle and now you're in a city. You can carry the city around with you. It's very convenient when you're out in the desert and you wanna go visit someplace that has a nightlife, right? Um, <laughs> so those sorts of uh, movable spaces like portable holes or other uh, object dimensions, I, I think they're in a slightly different category than the great big, what is the fairy realm where the elves live, right? Yeah, But they're absolutely. both crossing that threshold. Totally. Celeste, do you have favorite examples? Yeah, I think uh, so a couple from like pop culture, like I mentioned the upside down, obviously in Stranger Things, like when you're dipping into that, that shadowy under reality, that is totally, you know, the pocket dimension that exists underneath in between our own. Uh, and then for like sci-fi examples, like you can think of the holodeck. Whenever they go into the holodeck, it is a world that is programmable to be something different. The rules there exist differently. It's a digital space. So you can really find examples of this throughout media um i mean one of my favorites that i really like uh, is like the phantom toll booth going into that world where everything yes. is you know alliteration and so literal uh but it has and always connects to elements of our own world they're never completely uh foreign spaces it just it takes information we know and redefines it uh so those are some of the examples that that just came to me yeah I'm going to throw out two other examples that are on opposite ends of the spectrum. The first is fluid space from the Star Trek universe, where mm -hmm. the weird, super weird aliens come from. And that's not a place that they go. That's a place that conflict comes from, which I think is another very important um, f function of, uh, of a pocket realm, essentially. It's, right. it's not a place where you go for adventure. It's a place where the inciting incident comes from and lands in your lap. And the yes. other one is Hades. Yes, oh. the land of the dead, where the rules are different. If you eat a pomegranate, you now live here. It's a right. really, it's like as classic in the literary sense as, as you can get. But um, yeah, that's a, that's a pocket rom. Right. Oh, and there's one more from the D&D &D and tabletop world. I mean, we should put forward Ravenloft as a classic. Oh, yeah pocket sure. realm right yeah, domains of dread absolutely yes. Up those you pockets. enter the mists oh yep. no you know what's oh happening. gosh <laughs> <laughs> we've got some from the chat serum s uh seven six says inside the tardis a great example yep. uh yes. oz wonderland and neverland all fantastic yes. examples as well good job yeah. chat 
So we've and the matrix. Nice one. Ooh, yes, absolutely. Yes. A pocket realm. So why are pocket realms useful? Why do we need them? What do they do for us in like good heavy lifting storytelling mechanics? Good heavy lifting storytelling mechanics. Well, for a lot of the ones that come out of the literary and film space, what we want as storytellers is a point of view character, a protagonist, a hero from a world we know and understand, someone sympathetic, and then we want to run them up a tree or <laughs> pitch them into a pocket dimension, pocket realm, where we've already started to relate to the plucky young heroes who ride their bicycles around the neighborhood of Stranger Things, right? But, um, but suddenly they are not quite in our world all the time and dealing with something totally outside their experience. It's a great way to throw a hero into the soup, story-wise. Yeah. Yeah, you definitely, I mean, you, you, you try and test familiar heroes when you put them in strange situations. I think that's, that's always the mark of a true character. You know, what do you do when everything is so strange and so different from the worlds you know? I think it also, as storytellers, allows us to play with more with imagination and with setting because a lot of people go to fantasy and they go to sci-fi to escape the bounds of reality. So I think when we can use these pocket worlds, it gives us uh, an easily understandable excuse to play with ideas that we wouldn't see in our standard world. So we get to create the strange villains who do construct their own universes and and want to break the rules of, of normalcy, you know, get out, gravity, get out of here, you know, like pol social politics, get out of here. Uh, let's redefine and explore what if the world looked like this or what if things worked like this. For, for that way, it's a, it's a huge tool for imagination. Yeah, absolutely. I think another great benefit of them, particularly if you're doing episodic storytelling, which is something very key to the RPG space, is that they bring freshness. They bring something else. You go oh, to it, yes. you have that holiday episode or you have the, the episode where they went back in time, right? You have another episode where they are in a different genre inexplicably except it is explicable because it's it's portal fantasy and the use of those portals the use of those pocket dim dimensions to change things up to present people with different experiences even even if um whether those experiences are hey we're in the wild west now guys isn't this fun or those experiences are more character centric like you've gone to a universe where now everyone has changed gender discuss um you know these are things you can do that can drive a story forward and do interesting things for characters but they also provide just a lot of freshness, I think. Um, so if you're writing a really long series or if you're doing week after week an RPG game, they can be really helpful for, for that. Yeah, so uh, I'll ask, oh, sorry, I'll just no, I'll no, also no. sneak in here too, like as a game designer, when you have people who are so familiar with the way mechanics work, uh, sometimes they can feel very stale. So it's like, yes, okay, we're level 15, opening a door, going through a dungeon, room to room doesn't really work at level 15 in D, D, right you can yeah. just overcome subvert all the challenges but in a pocket dimension as a game designer you can actually revisit those mechanics and redefine what they are and people are okay with that it's like giving a, a whole different shape to your rubik's cube right when you come in here so it's a whole new challenge you get to step out of that as a game designer and and really dig into something exciting I want to jump on that because, of course, one of the attractive features of Pocket Realms is this ability to change the rules. Things are yes. different there. Um, they're isolated spaces where it's safe to change the rules in your setting without overhauling your internal logic, your meta, as we call it on World Anvil, your, your world scaffolding. So what are some examples of interesting ways that you can change the rules and why are they interesting for storytelling? Like, what, do they, what do they bring to your, your campaign, your story, your well, adventure? Sure, I'll go back to Ravenloft for a minute, right? <laughs> Where um, the first rule that changes is suddenly you're trapped, right? You can't mm -hmm. get out. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's familiar to a lot of pocket realms where all the resources and people and connections and powers you know are suddenly not available to you because you're somewhere else. You can't go cry, crying to the city watch or calling in the cavalry. Um, so isolation is sort of the first thing, but then in particular for Ravenloft, 
all the rules that engender fear, horror, and loathing uh, can be ramped up, right? Yeah. Everything that is a mechanic based around um, making life harder and more horrific, um, those rules can be bent permanently in that space. And when finally people escape or don't, uh, they're relieved to get back to the normal mundane world where heal spells work a little better and uh, there aren't werewolves every night, right? So sure. um, you can change, basically switch genres in mechanical terms. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if, you're, if your genre is darker, enforce that. Make make it make it mechanically darker. And even if you're um, even if you're writing a novel rather than writing an RPG, you can do that. You can make the world a harder place. You can make the good things less good and the bad things worse. Right. Um, or make but, the bright things brighter. I mean, if you're going to the summer lands of the elves and everything mm -hmm. is bright and shining and wonderful, but you come from a cyberpunk dystopia, your first the character's first reaction is, why is everyone so Probably nice? Terror. Yeah. Right? What do they want? <laughs> what do they want? Where are where what are they their... on and can I have some in <laughs> yeah, fact right? for the cyberpunk <laughs> world? Drugs being a, a strong one. <laughs> why, right. Why doesn't my cell phone work? Um <laughs> So, uh, I mean, it's, it's that shift of the reference framework that I think gives these realms their power. And if you start dystopian, you might go brighter or vice versa. Um, the other thing I think is great about these realms where you're changing things mechanically is you don't explain the mechanics until the characters stumble across it, right? Mm -hmm. It's dark and gloomy. Well, I'll just cast daylight. Ooh that doesn't work here. It's a wispy little candlelight, right? Or, um, you know, I'm going to teleport home. Ooh, no, that doesn't work either. So it's, um, you can hide or just tell the game master, what are the new rules? And part of the fun for the play experience is the players bumping up against what's different. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's how you give exposition, essentially. Yes, yes. Yeah. Definitely that. I mean, that's something that I, I always talk to people about in, in their adventures or how to be a better game master. It's if you can show your players instead of telling them things at, at any point, like how much more fun is it to walk into a town where gravity doesn't exist and people are flying all over the place, as opposed to saying somewhere in the world, there is a town where there is no gravity. Uh, that's that's the, the thing, getting that experience, uh, it totally activates our puzzle solving nature. It really enhances that exploration pillar of play that so often yes. gets forgotten uh, over the course of, of designing these games. I also like that these pocket dimensions, they give a sense of urgency that I think doesn't necessarily inherently exist in a lot of campaign settings. Because if you do find yourself suddenly trapped in a world where the rules are different, automatically you have a drive to get out you have a drive to solve why just even being put in that scenario uh, affords an opportunity to quest to to yeah. discover so just even changing that location the story framework just becomes so much more exciting when you have stakes like that yeah what are some other parameters you can tweak or change for for pocket dimension, shadow realms, that kind of thing. One that comes to mind for me is Narnia, where the time works differently. That's quite a common one. Yes, mm -hmm. it, that comes, I mean, the fairy tradition is the same way, right? You go under the hill and six years later, you come back out. Yeah, and it's been one night for you. Yeah, Or, or vice versa, you spend three years in Narnia and, and you come back and everyone's like, you haven't missed tea time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. love uh, my favorite thing to do and something I, I enjoy about the Fae too is challenging the way um, social interactions work, um, you know, because like things like capitalism are so inbred in so many of our societies. It's like what happens when you do get into a space where everything is deals, everything is contracts, you're trading things and it's not just material things. What if it's it's thing, it's memories, it's it's feelings, it's loyalties uh, when you can trade anything. Uh, when you can purchase with anything, that's that's a hugely interesting thing to throw out a balance or challenging the way typical family structures work or governments. Uh, you can absolutely break all of these social rules that have become so inherent and like that is our framework to understand because at its core i mean dnd is still like medieval fantasy like we can understand there are castles and lords and lands that battle and da, 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 da. 
And when we really open up and question our assumptions in that way, it can become very interesting. Yeah. What I'm really hearing from you guys is the sky's the limit, which is what I love. Like, <laughs> yes. get creative. This is this is the space to f things up. I'm going to say because <laughs> we like to keep the podcast as PG as we can. Right. Um, right. But that's absolutely <laughs> it. The 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 consequences to your your original world, your meta, are minimal. Right. Mm -hmm. um, the nice thing is it's isolated and contained, and the, at the moment the characters leave the space everything snaps back to how it was yeah um so there's no reason not to have super science or um you know straw driven mist horror um amped up to as high as you can get it to go uh it's a thrill to play with it at max volume and yeah. generally these pocket dimensions are short term right you're not always setting a full game there you're not you might have a full novel there but the the thought is always you're going back to normal yeah absolutely um demetrius has written has just written jumanji in the chat yes, <laughs> um, yes. yes. <laughs> which is another completely classic example of portal fantasy a pocket dimension a amazing example there and a, a great game within a game if you see what i mean um <laughs> Okay, so we've talked about what you can change. What are some tropes of pocket dimensions? That's an interesting question. I love talking about tropes because on the one yes. hand, they are our best friend. They help people shortcut to understand what's going on, but they can right. also be predictable. So it's very useful to understand what is there so we know what we're working with. Yeah, I think com communication is a big one, like challenges to communication that have to be overcome. Um, I just thought of another one, like in Spirited Away, like, so it was talking like Miyazaki, like going into a world where it's just like, whoa, I, I don't understand what these people want. Maybe don't speak the language. I don't understand what's going on here. So being that other mm -hmm. and the danger that is associated with that. And of course, either having to find allies in this new world who can explain, getting a teacher to help you along the way, that sage figure that's so the common. Yeah, yeah. Or, right. you know, railing against the system as this like independent just force. So I think those those roles in communication are a big trope that gets played with in pocket realms. Right. I playing off of that, the sage sort of figure you mentioned i think is also sometimes the guide to the new world mm -hmm. right whether it's um you know dante's guiding you through the layers of hell or it's uh, mr tumnus being your first friend in narnia or or the guys on the other side in the matrix right where suddenly um they seem to understand the rules and are willing to to help you out um, I think that guide figure can be really important if you don't, for film and stories, it's easier. For games, if the guide is too good, you've made it too easy for mm -hmm. the players, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. One so of an my unreliable favorite... guide or, or a guide who suffers or disappears is possibly better. One I'm of sorry. my favorite examples of that trope subverted is actually C.S. Lewis. Because mm -hmm. half the party meets Mr. Tumnus and the other yes. half the party meets the big freaking bad. <laughs> and they have then the unreliable narrator problem that mm -hmm. clearly somebody is telling the truth and somebody is not. But it's not immediately clear to the audience who that is, particularly as the audience is, is, is aimed at children, right, who are not necessarily as critical readers. Um, right. So but that splitting is splitting the party and giving two different guides is is a solution or a, a technique yes we should <laughs> celeste you and i should be you know putting that in our notes. we should be yeah <laughs> what, what are we doing here wait we gotta add a chapter hang on wait <laughs> right like those those figures can can have a huge influence on on how the pocket realm is perceived and and Absolutely. what people expect um other tropes though i think sort of the food or the key or the unlocking the way home right like there's an object sometimes the doors the portals uh, the to doors, find portals. yeah 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 there's a very uh, good uh game called sleeping gods it's a campaign board game which is portal fantasy cool. you get catapulted into this world you have to wake up a god to get you home the way you right. do that is by collecting totems 
to wake up your god and then politely ask them for a ride and apparently they give it to you it's very nice um but that's again that's a that's a version of that where the adventure is built into the way home it doesn't have to be that's that's worth saying it um but i think if you want the aim of your players to be something that is not just getting home you need to hammer them with a hook yes yeah i mean getting home can be a great hook i mean oz is the classic yeah uh you know, the tornadoes carried me away. I guess this wizard knows. The whole story is is quest fantasy straight to the wizard with the excuse that we just want to go home. Yeah. Um, that structure works, but it's very familiar. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Uh, Penumbra Mine says, trope danger. There is a lack of a vital resource like air or water in the pocket dimension and getting trapped there could mean death. Very nice yeah. idea there. Definitely one that you see. Another one is you have no power here. So whatever toys, whatever things that you had that worked somewhere else, they don't work here. Gunpowder and or they work against you. You know, like Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. You're coming in there like, oh no, now these rich bratty kids. All of a sudden, this is their downfall. Uh, That that yeah, yeah. Absolutely. That's a very nice way to shake things up with a pre-established party. So if yes. you have some power players, um, obviously you don't want to make them unhappy. So if if what they really like to do is just roll a ton of dice and hit things really hard, don't make them unhappy for too long no. because they will leave right. the table. Yeah. But um, shaking things up is a really nice way to, you know, reorganize the party a little bit, put different yes. people in different places. Oh, the, the Courts of the Shadow Fate does this immediately in a Fae storytelling way where, where status and social skill um, way more heavily than arcane or or martial power, right? The barbarians are all uncouth. Nobody listens to them. They'll have a hard time getting the goblin servants to pay attention. The charismatic paladin, every elf wants to be near him <laughs> or be him or, you know, or the, the clever tongued bard suddenly, instead of being the point man who's always talking, might just be the ornament that the fairy queen wants in her court, but really stay silent and play something pretty, Mm -hmm. right? So being pushed into new social roles is a part of that adventure um, because the, the, the strapping heroic warrior or the mighty mage isn't the way you solve the challenges, yeah. Absolutely. Just a reminder, guys, I'm having a great time asking my questions, but you can ask yours as well. Get those in. Um, just throw them in the chat. And uh, yeah, we'll be answering those in 15 to 20 minutes. Um, Secondhand Samurai says, Turkish delight is the biggest lie I've ever found in the book. <laughs> it is not betrayal worthy. <laughs> I did. I did absolutely want to try that after reading those books when I was very young and my mom looked at me like, why? And then I immediately understood. I was like, yeah. this is what is this? <laughs> <laughs> just a, a, a culture a culture yeah. generation gap there it is sure. an acquired taste shall we say <laughs> yes. um so um we've talked a little bit about exposition already but um understanding the rules of a space is key to avoiding that feel of ass pull like just solving a problem magically yes. that's what we want to avoid right we want people to understand what is going on to understand the parameters but we also don't want to drop a bunch of exposition on them. How do you balance that? The the one hand, making the players feel like they don't have control and they don't understand what's going on. And then on the other hand, making them feel like they've just had a a 1980s fantasy novel prologue given to them. (laughs) (laughs) We love them, we don't do them anymore. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Yeah, this is this is uh, something that I've been thinking about a lot since um, for Venture Maidens, the D&D 5th edition actual play show that I run. Basically, this season is all about going into the world of fairy and dealing with some of the more monstrous creatures there. So it has been taking these adventurers out of your standard, you know, medieval fantasy setting, dropping them into the middle of the fae where all the rules are different and trying to figure out the the pace at which to met you know out information uh that is satisfying but also it it, it feels good but it's also it's new information coming in uh so i think it, it really is a matter of pacing and that happens a lot you i mean 
to to get better at mastering this pacing just look at you know media examples when a character is dropped into a new world how many chapters does it take for them to actually really get a sense of what's going on and like we mentioned before providing some kind of sage or ally who does have answers and can answer questions is something very very important you don't want to just totally strand you want the characters to feel like they're totally stranded there but the players should never feel like they are stranded so so getting those allies, making sure you have clues that come out every session, even planning in advance the information that they might be able to learn from session to session. Like something I like to do whenever I plan a game session is write like one clue or one fact, one piece of information that at some point in the session they are going to learn. So it's always it always feels like progress is being made and then routinely awarding you know, rewarding them for getting that information. It's like, oh, well, because you learned this last time, you get advantage on these checks now. Or you know what? You can pick up a few words of this language because you spent last time trying to really understand what was happening here. Uh, so, so really giving out those rewards and encouraging exploration and curiosity, I think is key to, to making dropping somebody somewhere else really work and feel really impactful it it does become much more satisfying when they unravel the knot right mm-hmm, but you mm-hmm. don't want to make them wait too long right or <laughs> it's just or they will reach for the sword and try to cleave the knot yeah possibly with disastrous results but um i think it's important to let them fail a little absolutely yeah. right um try the things that don't work and most groups of tabletop players don't mind that challenge so long as it doesn't go on session after session. Mm-hmm. You really want it. Yeah, a sense of mastery in every game session is what I'd aim for. The other thing I'd point out is when you're designing for the game master who's running these games, you don't want to be coy with them about how it all works, right? Right. right. Spell it out up front. Like, Here are the seven secrets of the Fey world that you need to know. The players don't need to know them all at the start. Reveal them one per session for seven sessions, right? But um, but don't get too coy or obscure in the yeah. text directed at the person running the session. That's where you want to be completely clear. And I I see that mistake happen a more lot. Young, de- yeah, I see it a yeah. lot. <laughs> like where I'm like, oh, it's mysterious. I'm not going to tell you till chapter three. It's like I'm running this in two hours. Let me find <laughs> right. I it. I need to know the mystery. Um... Right. It's so something I, I, I love to do with like NPCs too. I get really excited doing like um, NPC, you know, role playing this NPC and like giving the motivation behind like, here are the characteristics. This this PC is like short tempered and, you know, they, they want this and they want this and they demand it. Uh, and then giving that motivation, it's like, oh, wow, well, like this thing happened to this NPC and this is their overall arcing motivation, which gives you informative information to how to role play them through the whole adventure yeah definitely i would say one of the um common mistakes which is actually where we're going next is um giving the npc who is the mentor too much information yes yes they should not know everything about the world they are not the game master they are a proxy for the game master so do not let them answer every single question of the players in session one because there's always one player who's like and how does this work and how (laughs) and And you're like well (sighs) that's ruined (laughs) yeah (laughs) yes and the answer is we don't go there i've never heard of that Mm -hmm. how about you go find out for me Mm yeah Absolutely. The other thing is that the sage is from a different world and does not necessarily know what the players need to know. They don't know what's Mm. strange about their world. It's their world. So there'll be all sorts of things like they shouldn't volunteer. Oh, you might notice that this is different because for them, this is their world, right? Right. This is normalcy. And these complete maniacs who've just come through insert portal element here, they're the strange ones. So that's where you can you can start show show don't tell that's where you can be like the sage looks at you strangely as you clean your armor this is clearly something that is not done here right whatever it is nice to play up the fish out of water and you're the strangers and i see it in everything from narnia where mr tumness is like are you really who i think you are (laughs) right 
to um I don't know in the matrix it's oh this is the new fish he doesn't know anything yeah. strap him in we have things to do right and and treating the player characters a little bit like well, not quite idiots but clearly people who don't know what's going on is part of the fun of entering that new space right the fey servants may say oh just sit down and wait the queen will be along and they're like we don't know what's going on <laughs> sit down wait right and answers will be revealed to you um i think it's great if npcs do just in fact say <laughs> Uh, we know you're not from here, right? That recognition of, yeah. of strangeness, it cuts both ways. Yeah, absolutely. So we've talked about, we've talked about a few common mistakes and things to avoid already, but what are some other things, things you see people get wrong, things you read them and you're like, oh no, you're laying yourself a very difficult path here. Mm -hmm. what, what are some errors people make with pocket dimensions? I, I think a big one I see a lot is people who continually change the rules. Mm -hmm. Because if you've already dropped the players into a totally different world where the rules are different, you need to let them learn and understand those rules to gain that mastery. If you keep changing the rules over and over and over again, then that will just become so frustrating and your players never feel like they have a foothold you have to allow them to learn and to use that knowledge well and stop if you keep pulling the rug out from under them they're going to stop standing on the rug that's that's what you are teaching them uh so so commit i think really early to what is different about your pocket dimension keep that firmly in mind and don't go beyond that uh, the, the human brain can only accept so many new things before it just, it just falls apart. So if your world is totally radically different in terms of environment, you know, maybe, maybe keep the people and the social structures very similar. If the social structures are different, have it at least look like our world. There has to be some point of relatability. Otherwise we just, we can't connect or relate to anything. Right. Those sorts of places that are pure chaos, limbo realms, in my way of thinking, are worth an encounter or two, terrifying, oh my goodness, we got out of the Lovecraftian non-Euclidean space before our brains dissolved, right? Um, they're, they're very brief. Yes. Um, and some pocket portals, as someone else was, a commenter said, you know, they're too deadly to stay in. And if the rules change too much, they're too chaotic to understand. And the only goal should be get out, get out quickly. Don't waste a lot of time there trying to, you know, play chess with Cthulhu because it won't make any sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think uh, everything in the kitchen sink world building, which is uh, one of my sort of, I have 10 world building errors. And that's one of them where I'm like, that is everything in the kitchen sink world building. You have made this too complicated. How much lore do you really want your players to absorb before they feel like they can actually play this game? Um, right. So everything in the kitchen sink is one to, one to watch out for where you're just like, and then there's no gravity. And then people only eat cheese. And every day is called Tuesday. And also everything works backwards. And also time is backwards. And they just get, it gets to a point where you're just like, yeah, there is no reason why this is there except <laughs> yeah. to add complexity. Right. Um, the other one I'd say is um, make sure we're advocating for your players. Mm -hmm. They're in a new space. It's scary. Yeah. They don't mm -hmm. know what's going on. You can hit them with everything all at once, but that's not a good way to advocate for your players. And I think some GMs, when they get to pocket realms, they get so excited about their pocket realm, they sort of forget that there's four other, five other people at the table who are also supposed to be enjoying this thing, right? Yeah. Well, it's possible to do <laughs> foreshadowing for your pocket realm or to lay a breadcrumb trail, right? Not everything is you're suddenly thrown into the matrix. Uh, it might be, we're trying very hard to get into the fairy realm for reasons of our own. And the bard, the wizard, the some lore keeper type character may have a string of data about it before you ever cross the threshold. Yeah. Um, it empowers that player because they think they know some of the rules. And then they have the fun of finding out, well, seven out of 10 of the facts that we know <laughs> about the fairy realm are actually not true, but these three are important. Mm -hmm. um, but at least it gives them sort of a mental map of where they're going. 
Uh, it also works out of game. If you say, I'm taking my medieval fantasy players and I'm throwing them onto the Eastern Front in World War II, um, you know, you can talk about the metal chariots and the strange ones and whatever else is going on there. Um, the players will say, oh my goodness, we're trapped on the Eastern Front. Is that Stalingrad? I don't know. Um, <laughs> they'll have a sense of what that strange world is and half of the fun for them will be saying, okay, well, our paladin and wizard don't really know what's going on, but we clever players do and, and that's fun. Yeah. yeah, it's actually dramatic irony. Yes. Literally, yeah. That's dramatic irony, right? Mm -hmm. I think, you know, talking on also player experience, uh, I think you have to remember that when you are dropping your players into a new, completely new setting, it is a learning experience at its core. There are people in this world whose whole jobs it is to to teach children or to teach adults how new information. So everyone learns a little bit differently. So when you are in this new situation and exploration is key, I think spending a lot of time observing how your players interact with things and how their characters on top of that interact with things. So you have to pay attention to the learning styles and what kinds of tactics for revealing information excite people and then try to adapt and parcel out information in that way. And there's also an element of patience that has to go into this because you never want to shut them down, say, no, you're learning this wrong or no, you, you don't understand this right. It's, it's just going back to basic principles of improv. Yes, and, or, well, maybe not, but uh, it's it really being patient and encouraging and realizing yeah. you're a teacher as well as a storyteller in these situations, I think is really important to keep in mind. That is such an astute observation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things I would add, um, so this is something that um, I talk about when I do writing seminars, uh, particularly exposition, which is exposition should be in motion and emotional. Mm -hmm. Now, this is true because your audience wants to see your characters interacting with stuff and getting emotional about things, because that is why we read books, right? That, that's what happens. Things happen and then people think, feel things about them. That, that's yes. books, right? That's what yes. we do. Um, <laughs> so you need to employ the same tactics with your players. Things should be in motion and emotional. Um, so put your put your your facts, your information into motion and see who's reacting to it and put make them emotional to your characters. Like sure. make make things that will will give them a reaction. Your characters, not your players. Don't freak your players out. They will, <laughs> they will leave you unless they're into that. I um, mean, one thing you can do is you can put a, a fairly standard story hook right in the beginning of your pocket realm, right? If yeah. you've gone to Ravenloft and the first thing you meet is some poor child who's lost their dog, well, at least you know what the stakes are. Mm -hmm. And you may quickly find out that the lost dog is a two-headed thing. But, uh, you know, you're learning about the world while helping yeah. someone, which is an easy <laughs> hook to grab. Yeah, I would say you you always should put a hook in very, very early in a new situation, because if they do have so much to learn and they're just dropped in the middle of nowhere and have no idea why, that can be very overwhelming. So give them a path, give them a, a, a sign that they can read that points somewhere. That's something. Uh, yeah, a, a, a talking creature a a clear you know a door that has broken in the middle of this desert well that means that there's a way to repair it maybe there are other doors some kind of clue to yeah. start yes. them on a journey is is very necessary yeah absolutely push them push them off the boat yes <laughs> um so let's talk there and back again what are some great ways to enter and leave pocket realms Ooh. So we've, talked so wardrobes. <laughs> we've talked wardrobes portals of course are a, a magical easy D, D way to to go anywhere and do anything but yep. uh some of the others i've seen are things like mirrors and water mm -hmm. that kind of yes. thing what else do you think somebody brought up like dreams Yes. Uh, memories. I, re I really enjoy like cerebral based portals. So if you're traveling through your own memories and it leads you somewhere or yeah. uh, some kind of spirit world. Right, yeah. exactly. It's it's if it's personal and in your own mind, that's always something that I really enjoy. Right. Certain seasons and times, I think, can be nice, like mm -hmm. um, twilight or midwinter. Right. Like you can't just go to the door. You have to go to the Stonehenge at midwinter and, and those sorts of bounding things because 
Yeah. It implies that once you've gone through, maybe you need to wait a season before you can return. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or yeah, like something wicked this way comes, you know, the carnival only comes yeah. this week of the year or whatever. Or I guess they just did that in the Witchlight Adventure too, um, based on that, I'm sure. Same thing. Uh, yeah. yeah, that 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 those liminal times and spaces. Yeah. When I was writing the Blood Grotto, we used magical storms to get people mm, places. Cool. It's a yeah. it's a nice way to do it. But yeah, um falling into Atlantis, the Bermuda Triangle, you know. The... Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So anything, exactly. anything that can I guess the point there is that you're creating a moment of blindness, a moment of nothing. Yes. And then the eyes open. So if it's sleep, if it's a storm, if it's if it's a portal, even passing through water or through a mirror, you're not keeping your eyes open. It's a moment where your eyes shut and then they open again and something is different, right? It's almost like a rebirth experience in that way. Yes. Yeah. Or it could just be a police box and there's a moment of darkness where you open the box and walk in. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, or you take an elevator and oh boy, it goes so much so, so much deeper than you ever thought it did as it opens up into something new. I mean, the elevator doors are your eyes opening and are closing yeah. and opening. Absolutely. Yes. I never I never noticed that until we started talking about it, but there's always that moment of disconnect, that moment of nothing, and then and then the new thing comes. That's that's a really interesting thing. I not something I'd spotted before. Demetra says, Outlander, gems plus stone plus will. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Uh, a... Artifacts. Uh, yeah, I think somebody mentioned in chat, cursed yes. objects, yeah. uh, touching an object, opening to somewhere else, keys. I think yeah. I'm going with the d the doors, keys, transportation. Um, there are always these, these objects and these certain things throughout history and throughout all art mythology that are those moments yeah. of transition. Yeah. Absolutely. Stargates, um, those kinds of things, yeah. you know, yeah. static portals. Um, Mists and clouds and waterfalls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And again, with so many options, what's that? what that's doing is giving you options to tune to your genre, tune to your yeah. tone, your player expectations, your individual cultures and all of that stuff. Um, so we've talked about getting players places. Have you ever had a problem getting them back again? Do they ever want to stay there? Because we've talked about pushing them off the boat, but some some realms are horrible, but some realms are really nice. What do you do? How do you get them back again? Well, I think that's that's always a really interesting thing to play with. And I think, uh, I mean, so many of our stories, if there is a group that heads into somewhere else, some of those characters become so changed that they can't go back or they don't want to. Uh, I think that's a really compelling narrative. So if you are playing with especially longer term pocket dimensions, you have to acknowledge that at the end of this journey, it could be the end of the journey for some of your characters or some of your players. And that's okay. When you are playing with these big transitions, I think, and if you're ever confused about what might be happening or you have an instinct that something is shifting, always just talk to your players about it. Like I know like when we were playing through um, Descent into Avernus from Wizards of the Coast, I had a character who stayed in hell at the end of the adventure because she was so changed by something I won't spoil, um, but she, she couldn't go back. And that that is part of that story, part of that journey. Sometimes journeys are not successful there and back again i mean you know we can answer like did frodo really just come back and be the same did bilbo come back and be the same Ooh. is that really even true is is there and back again ever actually true yeah. um i think that's that's something open-ended to play with so if if it is like a problem getting them back maybe that's actually the story i, I love that i think yes the character left behind that everyone else recalls either because they made a great sacrifice mm -hmm. or because they were so changed is a yeah it's a great finale and um and sometimes it's just a good choice for the character yeah yeah absolutely i think it must be something about avernus because i had two members of our party stay in avernus in the end corrupted beyond resolve mm -hmm. uh <laughs> I mean, I tend to send people into pocket realms that aren't nice, so I don't have this problem very often. But they, they, <laughs> he's, 
stay there. <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> you know, we play Call of Cthulhu and everyone goes right. to Carcosa. The ones who don't come back, well, best not to think too closely about what happened, right? We're great for their better sacrifice. Off for, yeah. right? Yes. But um you know, I mentioned sort of the Summerlands, the elves, someplace bright and wondrous. If I were playing a high elf fey character and wound up in some some bright and shining place that totally privileged fey everything, I might not want to come back. And I, yeah. It's a good choice. So I think what we're saying is it's okay. It's if okay. your characters like it that much, <laughs> it's okay. Well, stay. guys, you have been busy and I have a ton of questions from you, which is absolutely awesome. We're going to start with this one from Tillis, who asks, how do I make a pocket dimension believable with completely different species? Like, for example, shrooms. Mm. Mm. I think if you are, like I said, you know, if you're changing something really visual, if all the creatures in the world are different, then make sure that it's still grounded in something. So if that is still like biology, so if you do have shroom-like people, if they still have the characteristics of mushrooms in our world, in our real world, but they just can talk, like that is fine. Uh, as long as you can look at a creature and go, okay, I guess this is probably what it does. Even if it is all new species, that's totally fine. That is very relatable. And I think your druids and your rangers will be very excited to get to meet all of these new new creatures. I mean, if you're changing up everything, um, you have your work cut out for you. I think occasionally you can shortcut it um, with an aside to the players, something like, oh, you've heard of this or you know a little about this strange and mysterious thing, or step out of game entirely and say, listen guys, this is a short side quest, run with it, right? You can ask the players to embrace the weirdness, right? It, it need not be entirely your role as a game master to make it um, completely compelling and believable and parcel out every bit at the perfect moment. You can, you can just ask for some player buy-in and they may help you along. Great, awesome. What about interactions between magic system, for example, a source of power and the rules of the pocket dimension? So how much can, for example, you cut off magic users from their powers? This is a really good question, particularly uh, if you're thinking D&D 5e divine spellcasters, where you know mm. there may not be their deity in this realm. Maybe the magical Wi-Fi isn't, isn't picking up a signal. <laughs> Oh, that's so funny because I we did something similar to that in Venture Maidens towards the end of or, well a campaign one problem was like the problem with the gods and the problems with mortals and in that connection yeah. and I think especially in Five E which is absolutely a combat focused game we can we can try and pretend all we want that it's not but it is uh, you your players should never feel like they aren't powerful so if you are messing with magic, you have to give them some kind of replacement. You have to give them an answer quickly of what they can do. You never want your players to feel powerless or irrelevant for for very long at all, if ever at all. So if, you know, the gods are dead, then get a patron in there. Like that's, that's something that works. If the god is dead, have them possessed by the soul of an ancient hero. Give them something. Um, when you start taking away the core mechanics of the game, your players will resent it and things will break down. So you have to have a solution right there and they always have to feel like they can do something. Otherwise, why are they there playing a game? You're just writing a novel. Right. Yeah. 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 I, I think an alternate power source is just a perfect decision there. I, I also think if you are um, if you are playing with power levels, it's okay to tamp it down, but hint at there's ways to recover it, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, I'm sorry, your spells above third level don't work anymore, but there is whatever magic in the land that you can draw on, if only you could figure out how, right? Yeah. If you give make them hope, make it a yeah. quest to recover your power and say, maybe say out of game, hey guys, guess what? We're, we're powering this down briefly, but don't worry. Part of the story is getting, getting it back. Um, you can reassure people who are deeply invested in those fifth level spells yeah. or whatever. Make sure they know. Make sure they know that there is a quick and easy way to do it and you're not going to punish them forever. <laughs> You'd have it yeah. just taken away. 
yeah. There's a brief to... magically dampening scenario. Like maybe a session where you go into a dungeon, you get it, you get the MacGuffin and you're fine again. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, but absolutely. you just, yeah, yeah, that's tough. That's a tough one. The other option is to nerf everybody. Yeah. yeah. No. Sounds mm -hmm. evil, but do you know what? If that's part of your genre, if the point of this place is, if you have a theme and it's, it's overcoming adversity, well, do you know what? Everybody's nerfed. The oxygen level is different. Sorry, you're all suffering now. Let's see what happens next. And you know what? You can overcome it. You'll be stronger. That's that's a great story. That's mm -hmm. that that fits your theme. Uh, great question here from ECC Books. Any examples that you guys can think of? Stories, games, movies, anything where the perspective of the folks in the pocket dimension reacting to the intruders? Oh. Well, I would say every alien invasion movie ever, for a start. <laughs> we we I, are yeah. reacting to the invasion in our pocket dimension of them. That would yeah. be a start. I um I also immediately thought of the movie Pleasantville, uh, mm. which is uh, an interesting, so when, you know, people are, are ported into a 1950s black and white uh, TV show reality where everything is fun and happy all the time. And then the way that that changes, just having a different perspective uh, shift everything. Yeah. I don't have a killer example for this. I need to read more or watch more media clearly again when the gods come down to earth from mount olympus that's another example we are the we are the the pocket realm but because there is always um actually yes i do have an example i have a great example uh somewhat from the perspective of the regional inhabitants and that is avatar not, oh, not that avatar, the other avatar, <laughs> where we actually see firsthand these aliens, who are humans, come and invade the space. It is essentially a pocket dimension. It functions under the same parameters that a pocket dimension would within fiction. Um, so yeah, that would be that would be an example of that, I guess. Right? Pretty much. So. Speaking of uh, dodgy interpretations of pocket dimensions, Penumbra says, would the maze of the Minotaur count? Thoughts? Ooh. Uh, I mean, from the Cobalt Press side, all Minotaur mazes are pocket dimensions. They lead. Love it. They're, the they're, spell uh, literally right? says pocket dimension, I think, in the spell it description. It does. I mean, in the Midgard setting, you enter a Minotaur maze and you might come out of it with unharmed, but in a different city. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, absolutely. I think that's a great, great example. That's amazing. <laughs> I'm so sorry. On that note, exclamation point raffle. We made it place. almost an hour without a really bad pun. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh. That is, uh, yeah. We actually, on these streams, we run a pungent when we're not doing oh. interview streams, oh, where no. not only I, but the audience can submit their best and worst stinking puns, and we love them. We do Ooh. love puns here on World Anvil. So, yes, exclamation point raffle to take place in that waff, raffle, waffle, 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 raffle to a win waffle, a waffle. Courts of the Shadow Fey 5e PDF or Fantasy Grounds license key. Exclamation point raffle and make sure that you are following the channel so that you uh, get your tickets. Let's look for one more question. There was a beautiful one here. Um, what are, going back to Fey, your personal favorite rules about interacting with Fey? Uh, Wolf of Light's favorite are never thanking them, just leave a gift. A verbal thanks means you can't reward their kindness. Hmm. Nice. I think Any thoughts, my, guys? Favorite I, Fey rules. Yeah, mine mine is definitely like if if you ever take a gift, you will be expected to give something back. So that's something I'm playing with in Venture Man. It's like, even if it's food, like, no, food doesn't cost money, but you have to give something. Otherwise, you owe something. Uh, no matter how small or large it is, uh, that that's the the favor trading. I think is a, a big thing I like with the fae. Yes, I like the helpful fae, the ones that milk your cows and cobble your shoes. But right, never thanking them is a good part of that. Um, I think there's a part of the fae tradition. Well changelings right like that is a very long interaction but knowing that you your child has gone off to a fae court and is being raised there or you have gotten a cuckoo's nest fae child in the mortal world uh, i think there's so much story potential in changelings i can't even say um 
So that's this is something favorite. that was very interestingly dealt with in Guillermo del Toro's. Yes. Can I remember it? The Pan's Labyrinth. Pan's no, Labyrinth. actually, oh. much mm-hmm. less highbrow. Troll hunters. There we go. Oh, troll hunters. <laughs> Yeah, okay. I haven't seen that yet. I it is spectacular, either, actually. but significantly less highbrow than Pan's Labyrinth. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, that's that's something that they use there. Uh, it's something I use actually in the novel I'm writing right now. Um, oh. Uh, oh, I, yeah, also... I think it's fantastic. It's very interesting I... stuff. I also love that that Fae are so because they are such really like primordial creatures. Um, their their love of emotion and beauty and the fact that I think any Fae anywhere, if you play them beautiful music or you share something raw and and so emotional, like that is so attractive and so meaningful to them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a lot of the stuff I've read about the Fae has been 18th century because uh, A, it's mm-hmm. period I'm particularly interested in, and B, it's period I used to study for my other job in another life when I was an opera singer. And um, that was uh, that the Fae are very weird and oddly evil. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, the reason I am called Janet is from a, a folk song in which the male lead is being led into hell as a yearly tax from the fairy queen so the fairy queen has to pay a tax to the devil every year and she's paying this human and uh my character is the str- the only f- strong female lead in the 18th century apparently and she uh whoops everybody's ass it's a good song um anyway <laughs> i digress i would like to congratulate kayatan who has won the Court of the Fae. Congratulations. Please email me at hello at worldamble.com and I will get that delivered to you. One more time, Wolfgang, who are you and where can we find you? I'm the Cobalt in Chief at Cobalt Press. You can find me on Twitter at Monkey King. Uh, you can find me on the Cobalt Press forums on Facebook. Uh, and I show up time to time on the Cobalt Chats on Twitch Wednesdays. Glorious. And Celeste, who are you and where can we find your glorious self? Yeah. Hey, everybody. Once again, my name is Celeste Conowich. I am a full-time game designer with 2C Gaming, but I do a lot of freelance work as well with fine companies like Cobalt Press, Wizards of the Coast, MC at DM Productions. Uh, so the best way to keep up with me is to follow me on Twitter at C Conowich. If you do want to see the, the full catalog of the streams I run, the podcasts I produce, everything I've published, you can check out my website, CelesteConowich.com uh, and, and see it all in one place. And of course, if you want to hear me play D&D and put some of the stuff into practice you can always check out venture maidens uh which you can find on podcast platforms everywhere and streaming on twitch on wednesdays amazing and the book of ebon tides fifth edition enters the plane of shadow it is on kickstarter you can go follow the link that i've just placed a realm just beyond the mortal world sees magical power play new heroes and bring the secrets of the shadows into the light Wolfgang, what's your favorite thing about this book and why should we check it out? Ah, uh, everything about it is my favorite, but yes, Shadow Magic. I wrote a whole chapter on Fey and Shadow Magic. New spells, new items, magic that um that for me defines the Fey and and illusion. And Celeste, what is your favorite thing about this book and why should we be checking it out? I think, I mean, piggybacking kind of on what Wolfgang says, I got to make some incredible subclasses, not to do my own horn, but like getting to play with light and darkness and what that means and how to diversify that kind of magic from what we've typically seen. I think there are some really interesting options in there that, that you folks are going to love. Very exciting. Well, both of you, thank you so very much for being here. It was an absolute pleasure to chat with you on on this subject, which which is just fascinating and not talked about enough, I feel. <laughs> well, thank, well, thank you, you for, for having, having us. us. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Of course, thank you to everyone who came to join us today. Your excellent questions, your hilarious comments. A special thank you to RPG Dinosaur Bob, Helle, Mergendor, Listerine, Tillers. Wow, Tillers, 10 subs. Thank you so much. And Nerd Building as well. And for the bits, Laura Bones. We are going on a raid. Our raid shout is Light Up the Fort. So shout it out when you go to check out Kaora, uh, who made the map behind me, as well as many, many other very fine maps, tokens, all sorts of incredible things. Um, he will be doing map making and uh, yeah, 
is also a seasoned GM, game designer, and all that good stuff. So check him out. You also get 250 of your shiniest anvil points just for joining the stream. So why not? I would like to remind you all that the Best of World Anvil is now closed. We will be making up those shortlists, sending those out to our external judges. And um, we are very, very excited to announce the winners on our birthday stream on the 30th of uh, October. Yes, there we go. So uh, make sure you join us for that. In the meantime, I would like to invite you to grab your hammer and go world build. <laughs>